Welcome to the Surveillance Report 152 Q&A, where our patrons at $5 a month or more can ask us questions. Let's go ahead and jump right in. We're going to start with The Dressing Gown, who says, as a UK resident, the likes of privacy.com is not available to me, possibly due to laws and regulations around banking in the UK. Seemingly, more of the places I go are no longer accepting cash, and crypto doesn't seem like it's always feasible. So what payment methods would you recommend to help increase privacy and security outside of privacy.com and crypto that you could suggest for both online and in person? And then they have a second question. We'll get to that one in a second. So... This might be a controversial one, but I think the most obvious one would be like your digital wallet, like Apple Pay, or I think we mentioned in the past Google Pay. Apple Pay for sure, basically just, it, it does what privacy.com does. It creates a barrier between your bank and, like it, it generates a, a new card number so that right. your your card doesn't get stolen in a data breach, but your bank can still see the transaction info. Right, which your bank could do also on privacy.com if you're on the free plan. Uh, That's a paid privacy.com feature where you can hide the transaction information from your bank. Are you sure about that? Yeah. That's like, because I'm not paying and my, my transactions say privacy.com. I mean, it it should show everything else there as well. That's a whole paid feature on privacy.com where it masks the uh, information. It just says privacy.com and the amount. That that's not how it should be working. It's a whole like paid feature on privacy.com. Go in your settings. If, There's a setting for it. I wonder if I got grandfathered in. No. <laughs> it's always been like that. Hey guys, future Nate here with a couple quick updates. Number one, no offense to Henry, but he is definitely wrong here. I remember a time way, way back many years ago when privacy.com did not even have a paid plan. It was entirely funded by transaction fees. So for him to say it's always been like that, it definitely was not always like that. Number two, I checked and I am on a free plan and my bank account definitely does not have any information about my transactions. I confirmed that with the bank. I can only assume that I must have been grandfathered in. Truthfully, I'm not going to contact support because I don't want to shoot myself in the foot and have them go, oh, that's a mistake and remove it. But yeah, Henry is right that these days it is a paid feature, but I guess if you were an original OG privacy.com user way back in the day, you probably got grandfathered in too. So I just wanted to clear that up for those who wondered who was and was not right in this situation. Okay, well, either way. So yeah, I guess the question here is like, what are you trying to get privacy from? If you're trying to get privacy from the merchant, then yeah, things like Apple Pay or Google Pay, it's either in 13 or 14, Android 13, or which 14 is out now. They're they're adding that feature for you to be able to like mask cards and generate new, not generate new cards in a privacy.com sense, but in like the Apple pay sense where it automatically generates new card. So it's protecting your data from data breaches, but that's on the merchant side, on the banking side, other than paying for privacy.com. Apparently I, I don't really know of a lot of options to be honest. I would point people, Jonah just made a video on his YouTube channel covering Apple pay versus Google pay. And he goes through all the technical details. I haven't seen it yet, but I would check out that video because yeah, that sounds like a good recommendation because he's very knowledgeable about this kind of Yeah, so like for people watching, we just spent like 10 minutes discussing this, but I would go to Jonah Jonah Aragon's channel. We can leave a link to this, but he pretty much has a whole video covering the privacy and security implications for Google Pay and Apple Pay and the differences there. I know in Europe, you guys also have the service Revolut, which is very similar. Revolut is very confusing though, because depending on where you are, digital cards are not included in the free plan. Some places it is included. Some places, I think it's only like one digital card. It's it's a very hodgepodge way, probably because of all the local regulations and stuff, but Revolut could be one worth looking into. I think Ironvest maybe still does cards. I'm not really sure. And then you said as a second question, what are your thoughts on data removal services like Delete Me and do you recommend using them? If not, then why not? I use a service, I don't use Delete Me, but I use a service similar to Delete Me. I'm personally a fan. Here's my caution they're not going to get everything. So I think they're really good because I used to do the manual data deletion thing, but I used to do that back when I was a freelancer who made my own schedule. And I would purposely every year set aside like several days off to just do that eight hours a day for two days straight. And it was insane and it was time consuming and it was very exhausting. And then you had to follow up weeks later to make sure all your stuff was removed. It's just the average person doesn't have time for that. They just don't. Okay. So I I think these are great services, especially because they get all of that common low-hanging fruit. 
I still recommend that you should go through and follow up every so often and like Google yourself and try to find yourself, like really try hard and see if you can find yourself and remove those. Because like I said, they're not going to get everything, but they'll get tons of the, the easy stuff with an automated script. So I like them. I use delete me. I mostly use it for convenience and as a safety net in case I miss something myself. So I think if you have the money to spare and you have a service that you trust, I say go for it. But again, you have to remind yourself that uh, you also have to give up your data to these uh, services as well. So just pick one that you trust. Now, Mr. Camel 999, what would be your guys' recommendation concerning tax software for someone who's privacy conscious? Personally, I just don't. I have like an accountant. You might be thinking, oh, wow, that's like a, a big thing. But like a lot of account accountants aren't that expensive and they can actually save you money on taxes compared to the tax software. So it's actually like a decent, especially in the long run, if they find like a way to save $500 in your taxes one year, that's something that you might have been paying for like 10 years going. So I actually really re recommend finding like a good accountant, accountant that you trust because then they can take the necessary precautions for you. That's really the only recommendation I have. I haven't looked into like commercial tax software myself. I'm 100% in the same boat as you. If your tax situation is very simple, just do it by hand. It, it, it is kind of a pain and it sucks, but like I, I don't remember why I did it because I wasn't into privacy back then. But one year I did the 1090, what is it, 1099? Easy. Anyways, it's like the basic tax form that literally everyone has to do regardless of your situation. And if you're like young and single and you don't have kids and you don't own property, it's the only one you have to do. I did my 1099 by hand and they literally wrote me a letter that was like, hey, you're an idiot. You can't do math, right? They didn't say that. That's my interpretation. But like, basically I screwed up my math and I did it wrong. And I actually did it wrong in their favor. They would have like kept more money if I, if they went with my mistake, but they were like, hey, you did it wrong. We corrected it for you. Here's the, the amount you're actually getting back. So there's really like, unless you're just wholesale lying, you have nothing to lose by doing it with the 1099. Because if you get it a little bit wrong and you can't math like me, they'll correct it for you. Okay, Yaya, this is a good question. Yaya says, what's the best way to store recovery codes for 2FA enabled accounts? If you're using a password manager to store 2FA season codes, it seems like storing them there too gives you a single point of failure. Storing them on your computer in an unencrypted text file that they're often provided in seems like a bad idea too though. Yes, you are correct. So I'm a big fan of storing things in the password manager, but you are absolutely correct that it does create a single point of failure and that's something that really needs to be considered. If you choose to go that route, it's definitely the most convenient one. I would be sure to use a YubiKey or something similar, keep your software updated, use a very, very strong master password, things like that. Maybe even consider KeePass, something offline, just because that's one more obstacle in the way. I know what a lot of people do is a lot of people have two separate vaults. Like one is for passwords and one is for 2FA codes. You could do maybe like Bitwardens for passwords and key passes for 2FA codes since key pass is offline. There's a lot of different ways you could do it. But yeah, you are right. It's, it's a single point of failure and people should definitely be aware of that if they're going to do that and put extra precautions into their password manager, I think. I personally am able to just do a, like if you use something like a Aegis or something like on Android, uh, you can just do an encrypted backup file from there and then you just store that file anywhere you want. That's probably the easiest way to go. Just pick a client that allows you to do a nice, easy backup solution. I personally don't care about recovery codes. I just care about the seed. Then you don't need a recovery code because the seed is the recovery code because you can import the seed into any TOTP client. So I haven't had this issue in a long time, but on one of my previous devices, it was kind of an older device and I was dual booting. And for some reason, the system clock would fall out of sync in between switches. Like if I went from Windows to Linux or vice versa, the system clock would fall out of sync. And it took me the longest time to realize my seed, basically it wasn't generating the right 2FA codes because for those who don't know, the code, it, it uses the seed combined with the time in UTC to create the seed or to create like the code. So if you're clock is wrong, your seeds will like the code it generates will be wrong. And then once the clock resyncs, it won't accept any of your two FA codes because the clock was wrong. And now the codes aren't matching up. So I, I will say like, there are times when it's probably not a bad idea to have the, the backup codes. Granted, that was probably a really niche situation that hopefully doesn't happen very often. But yeah, like I'm, I'm just saying like, I can see why one would want the backup codes because those work regardless of the clock and everything else. Barnaby asked a question, I would like to better understand a point regarding VPN and privacy. From what I understand, if a VPN is supposed to impersonate you when 
browsing the internet. It needs to initiate the HTTPS connection to the server you visit. To do so, it needs to have your data in clear text. The specific page you visit, the get and post data. In this case, is it really better than navigating to an HTTPS website without a VPN? In this case, your ISP knows only the domain, the website domain. You are visiting not the specific page, nor the data exchanged. So there, this is pretty technical. Um, I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. So with the ISP situation, you're transferring trust from your ISP to the VPN. So you are putting faith in your VPN to not be able to try to gather information about you. It really is that simple. Like we can get into the nitty gritty of this, but if I understand this question correctly, personally, it depends if you trust your VPN to protect your data, because if you do trust your ISP, then sure, maybe using HTTPS with your ISP is something more trustworthy for you than having to rely on your VPN to be handling all of this information. It really comes down to your trust. Personally, I, there's, I don't think there's a single ISP in all of the United States that I can actually firmly trust with my data. And so when I use a VPN, even if the VPN is able to see the website domains I access, which they can, that to me is still at worst going to leave me where I am with my ISP. I think the oversimplification here is that even if a, a VPN can theoretically see website data that you access, it still will protect the websites themselves and everything else outside of the VPN tunnel too. Someone did reply on Patreon and I think they kind of cleared that up a bit. Yeah. Towards the end there, what you're saying is like, this person basically says like, can't the VPN see the specific page you're visiting? Like example.com slash whatever, whatever, whatever. The answer is no, they can't because the HD, like think of the VPN as like a layer that goes around your, your regular traffic. So if your ISP can't see it, neither can the VPN. The VPN shouldn't be able to see the slash whatever, 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 as long as HTTPS is there. And neither would your ISP. But yeah, I always tell people that whenever I run into people that are like, oh, there's no reason anybody should ever use a VPN. It's just a transfer of trust. I'm like, okay, at one point, my ISP was Google. At another point, my ISP was AT&T. And you're really going to look me in the eye and tell them I should trust them instead of Mulvad? Well, that's a better answer than the one I gave. <laughs> Well, I was just addressing that last specific part. <laughs> okay, David Johnson wrote, what FOSS or privacy respecting alternatives to TeamViewer would you recommend and consider using for remote access with graphics? Perhaps there are such options for connecting from a Linux machine to another Linux machine than for Windows on either or both sides of the connection. So I think you're talking about like remote control, if I understand correctly. And I'll be honest, I don't have anything. That's a very niche case that I haven't needed in a long time. Most of the time when I do need remote control, it's in a work setting and we, I'm not happy about it, but it's not my computer. So I don't care. We use Teams and I just don't care because it's a work machine. I've also seen Rust Desk and then there's also, I want to say there's some stuff built into some operating systems, but this isn't something that I've ever really done before. So um, like I used to use TeamViewer way back in the day. I used to use it, but that's not like something I've really used ever since I started caring more about privacy. So I will say at one of my previous jobs, we use team viewer pretty generously. I do remember this was after I was into privacy. So I did check out their privacy policy and it's not, if I'm remembering correctly, caveat, I remember it's not terrible. I just remember being impressed by it. That's all. I remember being like, okay, this isn't the worst thing I've ever seen. So definitely if there's better options out there, please go to them. But I think you can probably do a lot worse than team viewer. And that said, you mentioned Rust Desk. Uh, again, somebody did reply on Patreon. Patreon's turning into a little community, man. I'm happy about that. But somebody else replied. They said they just heard about Rust Desk recently, rustdesk.com. It is open source. It works on Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, Android, and web. I did not have the opportunity to test it myself, but on paper, it looks promising. So same thing here. I, I'm just hearing about this for the first time, but there's at least two people saying this might be one worth looking into. Last question is from Powerfully Max. It makes sense to encrypt the HD, HDD SDD on a desktop system. That's the question. I understand the point of doing it on an external driver laptop, but I'm having my doubts over doing it on a desktop and dealing with the limitations and inconveniences it can bring. Yeah, definitely a good question. So back when I had my desktop, I had like two drives on it and one of them had like sensitive data on it and I did encrypt that one, but not the other one. So that just gives you a little bit of insight. So I do think that the risk of something going wrong or someone stealing your drives when it's a desktop at home is much smaller than when it's a laptop. Because the real reason why you'd want to encrypt your drive is someone gets your drives and they don't have the physical access to actually view the data. If it's not encrypted, someone could just plug the drive into any other computer and just view all your data on it. Even if you had 
like a username and password on your user account within your operating system that won't prevent someone from accessing your data unless it's encrypted. Personally, if I had a desktop, I would still encrypt it. For example, on the Synology NAS I use, they recently introduced encrypted volumes. And so I actually went through the entire process of having to migrate all my data to the encrypted volume because they didn't make that easy, which was wonderful. Thank you, Synology. Quick note, that's why we were three weeks late on the podcast last week. Part of the reason Just for why. anyone wondering. <laughs> Part of the reason why. Because <laughs> I did the transition, but I was out of town and traveling. And so I wasn't able to get TailScale running again because when you uninstall TailScale, you can't re-enable it unless you're on the local network. It's, it's a mess. But yeah, all these things I didn't know before starting. But long story short, I would say for myself, I do still encrypt all my drives, even at home, because if someone breaks in and just steals all my drives, I still want to have some sense of security there. And I personally don't see a huge amount of limitations or inconveniences in doing that. Now, if you do have an inconvenience set up and it does get in the way, then maybe you should step back and see if it's worth it to you. Maybe it's worth encrypting your laptop, but not your desktop. Uh, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. I think it just depends on if you really care or there's you really want to take the risk into consideration of someone breaking in and stealing your desktop. It also depends what kind of data you have on the desktop too. It's hard for me to answer that, but I would say that there's no wrong way to do it, but if definitely if you want to be the most secure, encrypt the data. I had a lot of the same thoughts actually. I was going to say, so I'm a laptop guy. I've had exclusively laptops for shoot 15 years. So my, my first question is you say like limitations and inconveniences. I'm curious what you mean, because personally, like Unless you're like a pro Call of Duty gamer, I really don't think the limitations are going to be that. Or or alternately, you're on like an older device where like every little bit of processing power matters. I can't imagine there's really going to be that many limitations or inconveniences. I also want to mention like, I don't know if this counts as threat modeling, but like, what are the odds? So like, for example, my wife has a gaming laptop and she went out of her way to buy a very pretty case and the RAM lights up and it's really cool looking. And you know, the case is kind of clear and it's just like, it looks cool. It is a visually cool looking desktop. If somebody breaks into our apartment, they're going to take one look at that and go, that's a gaming rig and they're going to steal it. End of story. So like, if it just looks like a crappy old desktop sitting in the corner that maybe might not even be plugged in on a first glance, you could probably get away with it. I mean, that's kind of security through obscurity. So take that with a grain of salt. You could also just do like an encrypted f container or an encrypted partition. Like Henry mentioned, like if you have multiple drives, you can encrypt one for all your sensitive stuff and maybe leave like the SSD where all your actual programs run from. You could leave that unencrypted for performance reasons. I don't want to get too deep down the paranoia rabbit hole, but keep in mind, if you have a really high threat model, then, you know, obviously you have to be very, very wary of like proof of concepts about things being stored on the RAM and stuff like that. But that's, again, that's like really high threat model stuff. And then just like what you said about what the data is, you know, like, yeah, if it's just, if it's not that important, if it's like, oh, here's pictures of my cats and like, you know, three video games, probably not a big deal. But if it's like, you know, oh, here's like tax documents and family photos and stuff like that, like, yeah, that you probably do want to encrypt. One thing I'll add here, you don't have to subscribe to the Henry way of doing things. But the way I do things, just to elaborate on this a little bit, is I like to compartmentalize my sensitive data. Pretty much what I like to do is I like to just have peace of mind when I'm out and about. So like, I don't like to really worry if my laptop or phone gets stolen. So I like to keep my sensitive data on de like isolated devices where that's where the sensitive data is stored and that's encrypted. So that way my day-to-day -day life isn't inconvenient at all. I don't have to deal with any limitations or inconveniences. So I have ways of accessing my data in a very secure way, but it's not like physically on my devices. So that way, like, you know, if someone can steal my devices, I don't really give a shit. It's not a big deal. I guess I can't give like too many details as to how I do it for obvious reasons, but there definitely are like different workarounds where like you don't keep all your data stored on one device, but I guess it is an option for people too. Like you can just keep all your data on a laptop and then just encrypt the laptop and that's still going to accomplish something similar, but just keep backups in case your laptop gets stolen because it'll protect your data, but it won't keep your data. I do a very similar thing to you, at least in regards to my phone. I'm very big about like, I'll regularly cruise through the app settings and I'm like, all right, what haven't I used in a while? What can I just get rid of? And yeah, so that's all the questions this week. Thank you again to all our wonderful, wonderful patrons. We got a lot of good questions this week and we're looking forward to more. If you want to ask a question, the post to ask a question is live right now on Patreon. So feel free to check that out. And thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you this coming weekend on the next surveillance report.